Hi guys, today's video is about the two terabyte limit. You may have heard that some hard drive controllers are limited to two terabytes. This is one of the most frequent questions I get at my eBay store. So today I wanna to share with you where this two terabyte limit comes from and more importantly, how to avoid it. Now, for those of you who are impatient, here's the quick and simple answer. The two terabyte limit is a result of using 32-bit integers for logical block addressing. And the simple way to avoid this limit altogether is to choose SAS2 or newer hardware. Okay, but if you're like me and have a curious mind, you probably want to understand this in a little bit more detail. So if that's the case, stick around for the rest of this video and I'll go down the rabbit hole that is storage technology protocols and standards. So in order to understand this problem in more detail, we'll need to understand some concepts in computer storage technology. These include things like, what is LBA? What is SAS, SCSI, CDB, ATA, and SAT? And don't worry, SAT is not that test you took in high school to enter college. We'll also do a little bit of math to calculate the limits. And finally, we'll come back and discuss how to avoid the two terabyte limit. Let's start with LBA, which stands for logical block addressing. This is just an abstracted scheme to specify locations of data blocks on your storage device. Now, some of you might remember from the good old days, you used to have to enter the hard drive geometry into your computer, known as cylinder head sector or CHS. We no longer do this today because we have logical block addressing. And in logical block addressing, the blocks of data start from zero up to the largest number needed to address all the data blocks on your storage device. The storage device automatically maps these LBA numbers to physical sectors on the hard drive or SSD. Now, keep in mind that even though LBA numbers may seem sequential, they do not necessarily map to contiguous physical sectors. One example of this is when your hard drive has developed a bad sector. When this happens, the hard drive will attempt to reallocate the bad sector to a spare sector. In this case, the LBA number doesn't change, but the hard drive automatically maps the LBA to a new physical sector. Hopefully, that gives you an idea of what logical block addressing is all about. Next, let's talk about SAS, SCSI, and CDBs. SAS stands for Serial Attached SCSI. This is a serial protocol that is used when moving data between computer and storage devices. It also provides compatibility with SATA2 and SATA3 devices. And this is accomplished through something called SCSI ATA translation, or SAT. Now, SAS is the descendant of an earlier technology called SCSI, and in fact still uses the same exact command set known as SCSI commands. So then, we need to talk a little bit about SCSI. SCSI stands for Small Computer System Interface. This is a set of standards for physically connecting and transferring data between computers and peripherals. It's an ancient technology that was first standardized in 1986, but has its origins that go back even further to the 1978 protocol known as SASE. Now, SCSI uses what is called a client-server model. If you're not familiar with client-server model, it's basically the same concept as your web browser or mobile phone browser. Your Chrome or Firefox is a client that makes a request out to the server on the internet and that server responds back to the client with whatever the client requested. So SCSI basically uses the same model, but with different terminology. In SCSI, client is called initiator, and the server is called the target. Now, if you're a free NAS or Unraid user, you've probably heard of the phrase IT mode in reference to SAS controllers. Well, IT mode, in fact, stands for initiator target mode. So hopefully that gives you a better sense of where the term IT mode comes from. In this client server model, the initiator sends SCSI commands to the target. And these commands are sent in a format called command descriptor blocks or CDBs. So let's take a look at some examples of SCSI commands and their CDBs. A full discussion of all SCSI commands is way beyond the scope of this video here. But for those of you who are interested, Here's a link to the full list of SCSI commands for SAS4, which should include everything you'll see from SAS1 through SAS3. And I also have a, this link in the description 
of this video for you. Now, here are some examples of SCSI commands. I don't think they require a lot of explanation, as I'm sure you can imagine what a read or uh, write command must do. However, you might wonder, what is the number in the parentheses for? What does the 6, 10, and 16 mean? Recall that SCSI is a very old technology that has evolved over several decades to keep up with the latest technological developments in computer storage. Back when first uh, SCSI commands were conceived, tens of megabytes was considered the norm. While today we walk around with USB flash drives with hundreds of gigabytes. So over time, the same read or write command had to also evolve. And with this evolution, more space was required for those commands. So the number you see in the parentheses is the number of bytes of the associated CDB. So read 6 uses a 6-byte CDB, and read 10 uses a 10-byte CDB, and so on and so forth. So let's take a closer look at the format of some of these CDBs. Here, we're looking at the format of the 10-byte CDB that can be used for read 10 or write 10 commands. The first byte is the opcode, and basically this describes what the command is. For example, read 10 command has an opcode of 28 in hexadecimal, and the write 10 command has the opcode of 2a in hexadecimal. Now, the most relevant part of this CDB to this discussion are the bytes 2 through 5, as you can see here. These are the bytes used for logical block addressing. And as you can see, with only four bytes, that provides a total of four times eight bits or 32 bits. Let's do some math and see what the 32 bits can do for us. So with 32 bit integer, we can calculate the total number of logical blocks we can count by taking two to the 32nd power. This results in a number that is about 4.29 billion now, for the longest time, most hard drives and storage devices use 512 byte sectors. I know today we have devices with 4K sectors, but we'll use the 512 byte number here so that we can figure out the lower end of the limit. If we multiply the 4.29 billion by 512 bytes, we get two terabytes or 2.2 terabytes. So here we've identified where the so-called two terabyte limit comes from. Now let's take a look at the CDB for read 16 and write 16. Here we have the 16-byte CDB format, which can be used for read 16, write 16 commands. As before, the first byte here is the opcode. However, what's interesting to our topic here is bytes 2 through 9, which is used for logical block addressing. As you can see here, in the 16-byte CDB, we have a much larger space reserved for LBAs. And in this case, we have eight bytes times eight bits per byte for a total of 64 bits for LBA. So let's look at the math for this. As before, we'll calculate the total number of logical blocks we can count by taking two to the 64th power. This gives us a very large number that is about 18.4 quintillion. And as before, we'll multiply this number by 512 bytes and we get 8 zebibytes, or about 9.4 zettabytes. So clearly, by using a 64-bit LBA, we have a limit that is practically limitless relative to today's storage capacities. But wait, so far we've been talking about SCSI and SAS, but what about SATA? Now, I know many of you build home servers or home lab machines using SATA drives as they are often more affordable. So then, how does everything I've talked about so far relate to SATA drives? SATA drives use a slightly different command set, known as the ATA command set, and it is its own standard. Interestingly, ATA 6 revision of this standard from 2002 specifies a 48-bit LBA, which has a limit at around 128 pebibytes or 144 petabytes. So it would seem that SATA drives that conform to ATA6 or newer standard should be able to surpass the two terabyte limit. Now, I'm not going to go into more de any more detail about the ATA command set, but for those interested, here's a link with more information should you be curious. I will also leave this link in the video description for you. Now, recall that I had mentioned that SAS 
can support SATA 2 and SATA 3 drives. This is accomplished by something called SCSI ATA translation or SAT. And the subsystem that does the SCSI to ATA translation is called the SCSI ATA translation layer or saddle. For more information about SAT, check out this link uh, too, and this will be also be in the video description. So when you think about it, when you are using SATA drives with a SAS controller, the saddle has to know how to properly handle the different LBA sizes. How does it map a 48-bit LBA number to a 64-bit LBA? And even more challenging is how does it map a 64-bit LBA back to a 48-bit LBA? If the higher bits of a 48-bit LBA are all zeros, does it just map to the 32-bit LBA of the 10-byte CDB for read 10? Or should it pad zeros to the most significant bits and map to a 64-bit LBA of the 16-byte CDB? And not only does the firmware of the SAS components need to be able to do this, but does the underlying hardware support 64-bit math? So the question of, two, of the two terabyte limit when it comes to SATA drives in combination with SAS hardware can be a more complex issue. But based on what I've talked about so far, let's think about what we need to avoid the two terabyte limit. First, we know the root cause of the two terabyte limit is the use of a 32 bit LBA. So immediately we know that we need something greater than 32 bits for LBA. We know SAS can handle 64-bit LBAs with the 16-byte CDBs, and we know ATA6 can handle 48-bit LBAs. Although the solution may seem straightforward, the, implement the implementation is a bit more involved. In order to support large LBAs, all the components have to work together. For starters, the hardware must be able to support large LBAs, 64-bit or 48-bit, not only does the hardware need to support 64-bit numbers, all the interconnected hardware components must work together, from storage devices to SAS HPAs or RAID controllers to SAS expanders, etc. Additionally, the firmware to all the aforementioned hardware must correctly handle large LBAs, and this includes the saddle or SCSI ATA translation layer. Another consideration, especially if you plan to boot off a very large drive, is the BIOS of your motherboard and your disk partitioning scheme. If you use the traditional uh, MBR or master boot record, uh, that too has a 32-bit uh, limitation, which only allows you to boot off the first two terabytes. And finally, we have to consider the operating system software and make sure that it too supports 64-bit LBAs. So as you can see, a lot of different components throughout the technology stack needs to support 64-bit LBAs in order to avoid the two terabyte limit. Now recall that back at the beginning of this video, I said the short answer was to use SAS 2 or newer hardware to avoid the two terabyte limit. That wasn't exactly the only answer, but it was the simplest answer. So, let me explain that in a little bit more detail. Here is a cutout from LSI technical documentation regarding support for large LBAs in their SAS 1 hardware. As you can see, there was a change in the firmware at phase 13 or P13 for SAS 1 hardware. Prior to P13, non-RAID SATA disks would incorrectly report their capacities. This was fixed in P13. This probably means that the firmware prior to P13 had a saddle that did not correctly handle the translation of 64-bit LBAs to 60, uh, oh, sorry, 48-bit LBAs to 64-bit LBAs. Non-RAID SAS disks, however, worked with all capacities, which is probably a result of the ability to pass through the 16-byte CDB that handles the 64-bit LBAs, so long as your operating system can handle them. However, with IR firmware RAID disks, the 2 terabyte limit is still in place. And this is probably due to the fact that with IR firmware, the controller can't just pass through the CDBs, but has to be able to process them from the drives and form them into a RAID volumes. The SAS-1 LSI hardware simply lacked the capability to handle 64-bit LBAs, and so no firmware change could really remedy this problem. 
So when we say that LSI SAS 1 hardware cannot handle 64-bit LBAs, technically it isn't completely true. It does work for SAS disks that are non-RAID or pass-through. However, in all other cases, the 2 terabyte limit remains intact. This answer, of course, is a bit more complicated. And so the simple answer remains, just avoid SAS 1 LSI hardware. Now, with that said, LSI SAS 2 hardware also has a saddle problem when it comes to SATA drives. And so firmware P10 or above is required for greater than two terabyte drives. Fortunately, P10 is pretty old. And if you do have P10 firmware, it is quite easy to update it. All of the HBAs in my eBay store are SAS 2 or newer and updated to the latest firmware. So in other words, another way to avoid the two terabyte limit is to buy from the artist server. Okay, with that said about LSI hardware, the story isn't exactly the same when it comes to SAS1 hardware from other manufacturers. Companies like Adaptech, Microsemi, and Highpoint all have varying levels of support of 48-bit or 64-bit LBAs. I won't go into the details of all these other brands, but I do know their technical documentation will usually advertise whether large LBAs are supported or not. So if you have one of these cards and you're wondering if you need to upgrade your controller for larger hard drives, first take a look at the technical specifications for 64-bit uh, or 48-bit LBA support. So that's it guys. I hope you found this information useful and enjoy a deeper understanding of the 2 terabyte limit and the various technical caveats that go along with it. Of course, if you buy from my eBay store, the Art of Server, the 2 terabyte limit is one thing you don't have to worry about. You'll find a link to my eBay store in the description section here. Alright guys, thank you very much for watching and have a great day. Hey guys, so I wanted to add this final segment to this video to ask for your feedback. I'll be honest, I've sat on various versions of this video for many weeks. And I wanted to add this to the end of this video because I know if you've dedicated your time watching or listening to me to the very end, I feel like it's your opinion that I will value the most. You see, I worked in the corporate world for many, many years, and to be completely honest, I really hate presenting information on slide decks. I know I'm not a professional entertainer, and my purpose here on YouTube isn't exactly to entertain you, but to educate and share knowledge regarding enterprise servers. But presenting information on slide decks just seems less than ideal. In this case, the information was just really abstract, and there it wasn't much I could present to you physically that seemed to make sense. So after many tries, I ended up with the slide deck that you just saw. So I want you to let me know in the comment section. Do you think the information in this video was presented effectively? And if not, how do you think it could have been presented better? I would really value your opinion to help me make this channel better for you guys. And as always, thank you very much for watching and please let me know what you think.